greet you again today in the name of our most trustworthy and merciful Lord, the express image of the Father, our God, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hope that you've all had a good Thanksgiving week, had a good time uh, sharing some food maybe with friends or family, maybe even some new friends that you've made. I don't know. Uh, before we get into the message that I want to share with you this morning, I want to just kind of give you a couple of PSAs, the first of which is uh, a special welcome to any of our guests this morning, anybody who's just new to the community. You'll see in the um, seat back in front of you this card. It says welcome on the top, if you just find there. And on that card, there is a QR code. And if you just point your phone's camera at that code, then that will take you to our welcome form where you can just put in your name and your phone number, and that will give me a chance to send you a text message this week and just say thank you for coming and let you know that I appreciate that you've been here. We really appreciate that you are uh, joining us for worship this morning. And so if you are willing to just share your name and phone number, then uh, I would love to just send you a message this week. If you are already connected, you've been here before, but maybe you would like to get a little bit more involved, maybe you would like to get our email updates that we send out every week. I've been sending out emails um, uh, on a weekly basis just to kind of give everybody an update, give you a little preview of my sermon and that kind of thing. We've got that purple card that's there, and you can scan that code and, um, and get some more information or get a little bit more connected with us. All right, the next thing before I drag this on too long <laughs> that I want to encourage you about is some of our social media channels that we've been utilizing um, for the last few years and especially in the last maybe two or three months we've been starting to ramp up a little bit our usage of social media and we've just been putting some emphasis into this we're going to continue to grow our work in that area but social media is an important opportunity for us to make connections with new people in our community and beyond and so I just want to make a quick appeal to you if you already use Facebook or Instagram, if you're on YouTube, then you can help us gain traction and make connections with people in our community. If you search for our accounts uh, on those channels or you use this QR code, that will give you all the links to all of our social media accounts. Um, and then when you follow our accounts, if you like one of our posts or if you comment on it, or even better yet, if you share it, then the algorithm that the social media companies have put together is going to share that content more with other people and there's a bigger chance that somebody else in our community is going to see it. Um, so this is important because we are ready to receive guests and to help them find a community and to become disciples of Jesus and so now we need to go out and invite them to come and join us and become Jesus's followers. But where are most people to be found today? You can find them online, almost everybody. And so many of them are going to come and connect with us in person, but they're probably not going to do that until after they've already started to get a sense for who we are online. And so our social media channels are one way that they can do that. They can find out if we're a weird cult people, right? They can listen a little bit to what kind of preaching is there. They can kind of try to get a sense for what do we believe and what is it that we teach. And so our social media is an opportunity for them to do that. We want them to know that we believe in a good God. Amen? We believe that God is just. We believe that he is righteous. He always does the right thing. Amen? He's compassionate, gracious. He is, in his nature, love. That's what the Bible describes God as. He is Love And his teachings then, his laws, must necessarily then also be right and just and merciful because they are a product of his love for us. All of them are. Do you believe that? Does your heart believe that? This question about what we really believe is at the root of what I want to talk to you about today. We're taking the next step now in the conversation that we started last week that we've been continuing on a little bit for the last few weeks talking about these two twin errors and you may or may not be familiar with them so let me go over them briefly just to remind you some of the things we talked about last week a couple of these are big words and they're easy to forget what they mean because we don't use them regularly 
Um, but I want to go over them with you real quick before we get into the very familiar story we're going to look at today. The first of these two terms is legalism. This is the error of trying to earn God's favor, earn his acceptance by doing the right things, by keeping the law, by living the right way, whatever that may mean to you. Legalism says essentially that I can become qualified for salvation by keeping the law. That's legalism, salvation by law keeping. Okay? If you've been in the church for a while, you're probably familiar with what people call legalism. But the second error you may be less likely to be familiar with, it's the word antinomianism. Antinomianism. Now it comes from two Greek words, anti or anti, meaning against, and nomos, meaning the law. So anti, nomos, anti the law, it's against the law. Okay? This is the error of thinking that doing the right things is unnecessary, or maybe you just don't want to do them and so you choose not to do them. Antinomianism rejects the law. And within Christianity, people can fall into either of these two ditches. Some people put an overemphasis on keeping the law. They become exacting and particular with their lifestyle. Others don't really seem to care all that much. They prefer to live life however they like without being burdened by the inconvenience of rules that they have to abide by. And there are Christians who are overtly in these two, one of these two ditches. But what I talked about last week was the fact that these errors also show up in much more subtle ways, barely even detectable. And what I mean is that you can be influenced by these errors even if you don't claim them outright. In other words, just because you believe that you are saved by faith, by grace through faith, that doesn't rule out the possibility that you may still inside be motivated to keep God's law in order to gain his acceptance and salvation. And on the other hand, just because you believe that the Ten Commandments are still in effect, that doesn't rule out the possibility that you might downplay the importance of obedience to the aspect of God's teachings that seem maybe inconvenient or unreasonable. And these two errors seem to be complete opposites, don't they? One deals with obeying the law, the other one has to do with disregarding the law. And in a sense, it's true that they are opposites. But what is more helpful for us is to recognize that they share a single cause. And that is they both are the result of the same beliefs about the character and motivations of God. And those mistaken beliefs, as well as the truth about God, are revealed by Jesus in the parable that we're going to study today in Luke chapter 15. Let's pray together and then we'll get into God's word. Father in heaven, we invite you to be with us, to speak to us, to guide us. We pray that you would transform us from the inside out and make us into your image by giving us a clearer picture of yourself, your character, and the deepness of your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's jump right into our story this morning. It's in Luke chapter 15. We're going to begin with verse 11. Luke 15 verse 11. This story is a parable. By the way, it's the third in a series of parables that Jesus is telling his audience about lost things and how they are found. We're going to start with verse 11. This is where the parable is introduced. In verse 11, Jesus says, there was a man who had two sons. So first of all, as Jesus begins this parable, he introduces the characters in the story. Your Bible probably contains a heading that identifies this as the story of the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. But what does Jesus say? He says, there was a man who had two sons. We always refer to this as the parable of the prodigal son. But this is, in fact, a story about a father and his two sons. It's not just about one son. There are, in fact, three characters here, and that's going to be important for us to keep in mind as we continue to understand what this story means. So far, we haven't learned anything about these three people. What is it that they want? What are their beliefs? What motivates them? What is their relationship like? Let's pay attention to those questions as we continue, as Jesus tells us more about what's going on here. He says, and the younger of them, so the younger of the two sons, said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. 
Well, what's going on here? Why would a son ask to receive his share of the inheritance? Have you ever heard of that happening? I can't say that I have. Now, in the ancient world, there could have been a couple possible reasons why a son might have done this, right? If there was a family business that the elder son would be responsible to take over when the father died, then the younger son might need to start his own business instead so that it doesn't create a power struggle when the father passes away between those two brothers. That's one possible reason. But as we're going to see, that isn't the case in this story. Jesus mentions no other mitigating circumstances for departing from the normal custom that the inheritance is given when the father and the mother pass away. And so that leaves us to conclude that what the younger son is doing here is, in fact, quite inappropriate. Now, in fact, in Eastern cultures that are based on shame and honor, this son's request is even more horrific. The son is basically bringing shame onto his father because by making this request, he is saying that his father is more valuable to him dead than alive. I want your money, and I don't want you. That's what he's saying. Jesus is describing a person who values possessions more than he values his own father. This is a person who would dishonor his father and reject him in order to gain wealth for himself. This kind of request would have shocked and horrified a community in Jesus' day. But notice how the father in this story responds. Jesus doesn't say that the father was angry. He doesn't tell us that he was pained or that he threw the son out or that he dragged him before the local elders for punishment. No, Jesus only tells us that the father divides the property as the younger son had asked. Verse 13, Jesus goes on. He says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. This son is pretty much the worst, isn't he? Now, Jesus does this quite often in his parables. He really makes us sure that we know that this is bad behavior. He just goes to an extreme length. One of Jesus' parables is about a debtor who owed 10,000 talents. 10,000 doesn't seem like that much because you might have $10,000 in the bank. Your car probably costs more than 10,000, right? But 10,000 talents is a ridiculous sum of money. It's more than anyone could ever pay back in their lifetime. It's basically like a trillion dollars, right? It's hyperbole. It's an exaggerated detail told in the story to make a point. And that's the same thing that Jesus is doing here in this story in his description of this younger son. As far as the damage that could be done to a father-son relationship in their culture, this is about the worst. It would be better if the son were a murderer. That's what he's saying. The son has dishonored his father. He said that he's of no value to him. Now, now that he's taken the inheritance, he's wasted everything that his father had worked all of his life to gain for him. Verse 14 says, And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went out and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Now, is this young man, at this point in the story, is he getting what he deserves? Yeah, he is. He really is. He's made a series of self and foolish decisions. He has disrespected his father and his family. He has wasted all of his money. And now he goes and he joins himself to a foreigner, which, by the way, symbolizes in this story his rejection of Judaism. More than that, he's feeding the pigs, which is an unclean animal the Jews weren't permitted to raise. For a Jew, this was the depths of degradation, the the, the extreme end of rejecting his religion. But he's so hungry that he wished that he could eat the pig's food if he could, but it says no one will give him anything. He has no friends to support him. No one respects him. No one even pities him. He's been reduced to nothing. But notice how things begin to change now that he's here at the bottom feeding the pigs. 
In verse 17, Jesus goes on, he says, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? He says, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. This is a real turning point for the younger son, but notice this. What does it mean? What does it mean that he came to himself? That's what Jesus says about him. He came to himself. It means that he acknowledges the truth of his situation. He recognizes that he is in need, that his needs would be met in his father's household. And so immediately this plan begins to come to him. He decides he's going to return to his father. Now, I suspect that, you know, this is such a popular story. You've read it many times. You've heard it many times. And maybe you're thinking at this point in the story is, yes, this is a good idea. He's going back where he belongs. He should go to his father, right? But think about how deeply he has rejected his father when he left. This plan to now go back, now that he's wasted everything, this is audacious. It's offensive. After everything that he's done, how awfully he has treated his father, valuing him only for what he could get out of him, now that his foolishness has made him destitute, now he's going to go back to his father. To an outside observer, it may seem like the young man hasn't learned anything. He still just thinks of his father as a tool. He's going to use him and then throw him out. The young man is at the bottom. He has nothing left to do. He has nothing to lose, and he knows it. And so he can't think about any of that. All he has now is to go and to hope for mercy. In verse 20, it says, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Church, this is not the response that we would expect to find in a story like this. And of course, you already knew that this was going to happen, but it's not supposed to be this way. Jesus is telling the story all wrong. Notice what happens when the son returns to the father. He hasn't even made it home yet. His father sees him still a long way off, and he's moved with compassion. He runs out to the young man, he throws his arms around him, he kisses him. This is an unexpected response on the part of the father. And as Jesus is telling the story, his listeners would have expected that the son should have been publicly shamed in order not to dishonor the family and his father. And it seems clear enough that the son wasn't even expecting this response himself. He had been planning to ask to become a hired servant. But he didn't even get that far. But this tells us something about the son's beliefs, his plan when he came home to the father. Pause for a moment and think with me about this. The son's beliefs about his father are partly right and partly wrong. He was right to have some hope that he might be accepted if he went home in spite of everything that he had done, wasn't he? Turns out that his father accepted him. He was right. He got up and he left the pigs and he returned to his father. So he had some hope. But he also had some wrong ideas about his father. Notice again what happens. He confesses that he has wronged his father. He says, I am not worthy to be called your son. And those statements are true. But how does his father respond to them? All he does in response to that statement, I'm not worthy to be called your son. All he does in response is he puts clothing on him. He puts the ring on him, symbolizing that he is, in fact, part of the family. He is truly and fully a son. That's how the father responds. The son says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And the father simply declares him to be his son. 
the father, by virtue of his position in the family, has the power to make it so simply by declaring that it is so. The son isn't even able to get the words out that he had planned. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Before he can say them, he finds himself already restored as a son. He came home knowing that his needs could be met by his father, but he came still believing that his father's favor must be earned. What he found was that before he could even repent, he was hugged and kissed. Before he could ask to become a servant, he was restored as a son. In church, I have to pause here to consider an important application of this parable to our lives. There's no doubt here that the father in this story represents our heavenly father and that the prodigal son represents any of us who have gone astray. Church, what do you believe about your heavenly father? What is his attitude toward you? What does he think about you? What does he want from you? Notice the truth about God that Jesus is opening up to us by this parable. The father in this story is generous. He is magnanimous. He treats his son kindly, even when he has every reason to be angry. The father is merciful and accepting. He isn't interested in punishing his son or getting even. He doesn't hold the son's misdeeds over his head. He's quick to forgive. In fact, the boy is still a long way off. He's not even able to get to the house. And his father sees him, has compassion, and runs and embraces. Does this fit? with what you believe in your heart about God? Or do you too harbor some misperception or some fear that you'd better get everything straightened out before you can really come to God, before you can be sure that he accepts you? What Jesus is telling us about our Heavenly Father is that what he really wants, what drives him, what motivates all of his actions, is to be united to you, his son or his daughter. That's what our Heavenly Father wants. And so I have to ask then, are you ready to come to him? Are you at rock bottom, down with the pigs perhaps, hungry and destitute? If so, then the best choice you could make right now is to go back to your father. You don't have to be at rock bottom, of course. You don't have to get all the way there. All you have to do is realize that your needs can be met by your Father in heaven and believe that he will accept you and choose to go to him. That's all it takes. He will meet you while you are still a long way off. He will throw his arms around you and squeeze you tight and kiss you. He will prepare a feast to celebrate your arrival. So I'm putting this question to you. Are you ready to come home today? Are you ready to go to God and surrender your life to him? Now, maybe some of you are sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, well, I already came home. I am home. God does accept me. I'm accepted. I'm not alienated from God. And if you're thinking anything along those lines right now, like maybe that question of you coming home doesn't necessarily apply to you because you're already at home, then the rest of this whole story is for you. In verse 25, Jesus goes on with this parable. He says, Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So this is the first time that this other son has been mentioned since back in the beginning in verse 11, where Jesus tells us that there was a man who had two sons. But what does Jesus tell us about this son here? The first thing that we learn about the older son is that he was in the field. And so right away, Jesus is setting up this strong contrast between these two sons, the younger son and the older son. Unlike his brother, the older son is a hard worker. He's faithful to his father. He's been out working in the field at his father's business. But at the end of the day, now he comes back to the house and he finds this party already in full swing. Verse 26, it says, And he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fat calf because he has received him back safe and sound. 
but he was angry and refused to go in. Is it surprising that he would be angry about this? That his younger brother has come home and we're all celebrating? Is that surprising that he would be upset? Shouldn't be. His younger brother has bitterly harmed the family. Now he comes home and he's welcomed with a celebration. See, Jesus is describing here in the older brother, a person who is concerned about what is just. You should get what you deserve in this life. And his brother is not getting what he deserves. And in verse 28, it goes on, it says that his father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Now here's the moment where we ask the same question about the older brother that we already asked about the younger brother. What can we say that this older son believes about his father? He has served him. He's been obedient all this time. But notice what his complaint is here. He complains, I have been faithful and I got nothing for it. His younger brother has been ungrateful and rebellious and he gets a party. So what is it that the older son believes about his father? He thinks that his father is unjust. The father knows certainly how faithful the older son has been and he certainly knows how unfaithful the younger son has been. The father has both the means and the authority to reward each of them accordingly. And yet he does the opposite. How unjust. But now notice how the father responds. It says in uh, verse 31, And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. You see, from the father's perspective, we can see now that the older son has the wrong attitude, the wrong perspective. Just like his younger brother, he misunderstands the character and actions of his father. Because everything that's the father's belongs to him, and yet he is living as though none of it belongs to him. He believes that his father is restrictive and ungenerous. And so he feels to his own faithfulness, to his own obedience in this complaint that he's never received the celebration that his brother is now getting. And that tells us something important about his own heart. Deep in his heart, he believes that the favor and love of his father is something that can be earned. The reason that he sees injustice here is that his brother, who has not been faithful, is receiving the father's favor, while he who has been faithful isn't. He believes that his father's favor and love should be owed to the one who is faithful, and it should be withheld from the one who is unfaithful. And this heart belief that the father's favor is something to be earned is a belief that is shared by a group of people who are listening to Jesus tell this parable. This is where Jesus' storytelling intersects with the lives of his audience. Let's go back now to the very beginning of chapter 15. This is where Luke describes what was happening that prompted Jesus to tell this parable along with the two others about the lost coin and the lost sheep. In chapter 15, verse 1, Luke sets up the story. He says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now that we've worked through the parable and the contrasting characterization of these two brothers, it's obvious that this story is a parable about these two groups who are there listening to Jesus. The tax collectors and sinners, as Luke calls them, represent people who have not been faithful. They're not churchgoers. They're not they're represented in the story by the younger son. But Luke tells us that they were drawing near to hear Jesus. Their hearts were open to Jesus. Their hearts recognized something desirable in him. They're drawn to him. They want to know more. But there's these pious religious folk around, Pharisees and the scribes. 
and they're complaining about this. Their grumbling is reflected by the description of the older son in the parable. We saw that the younger son, the sinner, was accepted. And Jesus says that the older son was angry. He was upset that the father was accepting the sinner. Jesus is addressing these two groups by the parable, and he's revealing to both of them the true heart of their heavenly father. It's a lesson about these two ditches of legalism and antinomianism, these two errors. They are two brothers. They're two different responses to the same misperception, misunderstanding about God. Both brothers were mistaken about their father's values and about his motivations, but they applied that belief then from two different directions. They both believed that the father's favor was something to be earned, but the younger son knew that he was unworthy of the favor, and so after giving up, trying to do it, and leaving town, he then hoped only to be allowed to work for his food and shelter as a hired servant. He couldn't possibly be accepted as a son because he didn't deserve it, he hadn't earned it. The older son also seemed to think that his obedience and hard work in the field would qualify him to receive the benefits that his father could bestow, and he was angry when he felt that he wasn't getting what he was owed. And notice, by the way, how the father responds very similarly to both of them. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but there are some interesting parallels in the story. In the story, Jesus tells us that the father went out to meet both of the sons. The younger son he met on the road while he was still a long way off, older son, he went out of the house to entreat him to come in and join the celebration. The father in the story cares for both sons. And what comes out in his interactions with them is a revelation of the true feelings and motivations of the father. What the father wants more than anything else is to be with his sons. That's what motivates him. When his younger son returns home. He runs out. He throws his arms around him. He kisses him. He doesn't wait for him to make his apologies or to return yet to faithful obedience. Look at how the father's words reveal his desire to be with his sons, to be united to them. When the younger son returns, the father says in verse 23, let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Unity with his son is what motivates this celebration. To the older son, the father entreats him to come in, and he says in verse 31, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. The younger son has fallen into the ditch of antinomianism. He's rejected his father in order to go out and live a happy and pleasurable life. But the older son has fallen into the ditch of legalism. He thought that he could earn what already belonged to him as a son. And this is the important lesson that Jesus is making with this parable. Yes, there are the more obvious truths here. Jesus is revealing that God is eager and willing to accept any sinner who comes to him. In another place, Jesus said, whoever comes to me, I will cast out. But more significantly, in this story, he is revealing the true heart of our heavenly Father. And it centers then on this question, what is the basis on which God accepts you? What is the basis on which God accepts you? To the Pharisee, as well as to the taxpayers and sinners, the answer was the same. It was on the basis of my faithfulness to God's teaching. The Pharisees thought smugly that they lived up to this standard and therefore were entitled to God's favor. The sinners, on the other hand, felt undeserving and worthless because they knew that they fell short. But Jesus paints a very different picture here, church, and it's one that we ought not miss. The basis on which the Father accepts his sons is very prominently not their obedience. The older son was obedient. The younger son wasn't obedient. The younger son had not yet demonstrated any obedience before he was embraced by the Father. He simply acknowledges that he had been disobedient, and the Father immediately reinstates him into the family. And so then we must ask, what is the basis for the Father's acceptance? It is simply this, the love of the Father for his Son. That's the reason he accepts him. That's the basis for his acceptance 
of human beings, whether they are faithful and obedient or whether they are unfaithful and disobedient. God's acceptance is based on his love for us, not on what we do. The father wants to be with his son. He wants to be united with him in love. This is the reason he accepts him back. And church, this is the attitude of the father toward you. Don't try to earn from God what already belongs to you as his child. He loves you because you are his. He's the one who created you. You can't change that. Nothing you do can change the fact that God made you, that he loves you, and that he wants to be with you. He offered up the life of his son to show you how much he loves you and to provide a way for you to be reunited to him. That gift, the gift of his son, is him coming out to meet you on the road. The gift of his son is him coming out to entreat you, come into the house and celebrate. So come into the house, celebrate with him, let his arms of love wrap around you and rejoice because you are his son or daughter. And he loves you because you are his. Amen.